We'd like to welcome everybody to the R Users Group at uh, the University of Texas Pan American. Today we'd like to uh, introduce those that are, are participating in this session. Hi, uh, I'm Guillermo Garza. I'm, uh, I'm with the math department. I'm a lecturer here at UTPA. Me? Okay. Hi, I'm Shen Shen Zhao. I'm from the Department of Mathematics. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Chun Li. I'm a first year graduate student in the math department here at George Yanev, associate professor with the Department of Mathematics. Tamar Orobi, assistant professor of the Department of uh, Mathematics. Sophie Wang from University of <coughs> American Mathematics Department. <coughs> Will Watkins from the math department at UTPA. It's a pleasure for us to have uh, with us in a teleconference today, Dr. Uh, Darren Rogers. He's from the State University of New York at Fredonia. Dr. Rogers? Hello. I don't look as fancy as you. I'm just sitting in my office, but it's very nice to be there or here. And I know most of you and the rest. I wish I knew you better. All right, well, um, I had this problem in my class, in my statistics class, last spring at UTPA. I was teaching this class in, and I had this problem that I wanted to uh, give the students individualized data sets to analyze for an exam. So there's a way to create individualized data sets for each student on some problems. Now, you could make this much more sophisticated than I did, because the way I worked this out, the students would log into Blackboard, and there was a test there, and the test would say, would say, have some questions, and one question would say, do this thing in R to get your individualized data set, and then analyze the data, and then give me the results here. So they're looking at Blackboard, and then they have to switch to R to do some analysis, and then they have to upload some things to Blackboard. Let's just talk about the individualized data sets. It's a lot of fun to use R's ability to create um, random values from a whole variety of distributions very easily to create some data sets that will fit the parameters of a particular problem. This was an introductory statistics class. Uh, fit parameters of a particular problem and you can even tweak it so that most of the time or some of the time or none of the time you will find um, say statistical significance or a certain effect size by just messing with the uh, random values, and yet in a class of 30, 40 students, it was close to 40, everybody will have different data sets. And yet it's relatively easy to grade because you will get their R data files. You just open those in your own R um, console on your computer at home after you download those, and then you will be able to see what they were working from. So, so this is our studio. It's been a bit customized. And I have this, um, oops, I have some extra things you don't need that I was working on. I have this uh, sort of customized R Studio thing where I like to have a nice dark screen in front of me. Um, but I just have this one script file. Now you have access, there's a lot of commenting through this, so you'll see that the, the gray is the comments, and I hope that's bright enough to read. Um, actually, I can make this a little larger to make, because I see some people scooting forward to see. Anyway, there are, some, there are some comments here, and I just want to dive into uh, what's happening here. This script, the script will create data sets and create an R data file and create a folder in the student's desktop that has all the stuff they need to answer all the questions on the test. On the test. And that's what I was looking for, is a script that the students could just run with a single command. And this, my students had been working with R, so they certainly could run a source command or run a, a simple script, um, but that command would generate all the students information and then they'd be ready to go. So here we go, like problem one on the test, let's just talk about generating these problems and then I'll talk about the rest of how the overall script is working if we have time. The question wording is a standard uh, introductory statistics text or kind of question, a barroom dance instructor thinks the color of lights affects the length of time people choose to dance. Not a really great control experiment, but for intro psych, it's fine. Um, or intro stats, it's fine. 
he thinks that the red lights will make them to dance, make the students dance longer on average. So I'm setting up an independent samples t-test here. So the first thing I, well, ultimately I want to go and create a data set of the number of minutes that a bunch of different students danced in the blue condition and the red light condition for the students to use to test. But I wanted to be extra fancy and vary lots of stuff randomly. So I, I start by setting this object BN. So B stands for ballroom, um, and N stands for, uh, N stands for sample size. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, of you are familiar with the sample function. It selects integers from a uniform distribution. So sample, I'm going to say sample um, from 8 to 12, sample the sample space, the uniform distribution of the integers 8 to 12, and sample me one number from there. So each, per, each student is going to have a sample size. Now, I stopped at the fussiness here. I could have made different sample sizes in the groups, but I wanted them matched because I wanted to be able to fool the students and have them have no clues to t from the data to tell them whether this should be set up as a paired samples or an independent samples t-test. And so if I had different sample sizes, I thought perhaps they would be, it would be too easy for them to, th to think that this might be independent samples. Um, so I, I just have one sample size, and it will be the same for both of my groups. So if you run that, um, for instance, I ran this and I got a sample size of 9. So between 8 and 12. And it'll be different every time you run it. So down here, now that I have a sample size, I'm going to use that sample size here to, um, as, as a base for creating the data set. Now the data set, I just basically need two groups of numbers. One number from the blue light people and one number from the red light people. The, the blue light practicing dance students and the red light practicing dance students. The blue light dance students, I call this B for ballroom problem and the second B is for blue light. Uh, I rounded, but let's, the, that's the last thing. I use the R norm function. So R norm will, will sample randomly from a normal distribution. The first argument that it's going to take here is the number of random samples it's going to take from that distribution. And default is, I believe, without replacement, uh, which doesn't really matter because it's a gigantic distribution. But uh, it's going to sample BN. So in our case, it'll sample nine things. And the next number will be the mean, and the next number will be the, the standard deviation. So if you look over here in my output console, I could say um, R and I could say the mean of five, and it'll give me nine numbers there with a, that are sampled from that normal distribution. But I wanted the mean and the standard deviation to be randomly varied as well. So I choose the mean again from a random selection. A random 765. Okay. Then the standard deviation is the second argument to our norm here. So our Your audio is popping out on us occasionally. All right. So then I do the same thing for the red light group. I, I choose um, the same number, 9 in this case, or somewhere between 8 and 12, whatever the student's random sample size is. I choose that number of observations, of fake observations. And I chose numbers, 45 to 65. It seemed normal. It seemed maybe people would choose to ballroom dance for an hour, for 45 minutes to an hour to practice. That, that's... I used to ballroom dance. That's a pretty reasonable time to hang around and practice for a bit. So here I have the numbers bigger. This is 45 to 65. Um, that's going to be the mean uh, of the distribution from which um, the uh, red light observations are selected. So I chose a higher mean. And I fooled around. I did some uh, testing back and forth to find these numbers. and I generated multiple data sets until I found one where sometimes 
you ended up having a significant result and sometimes you didn't, that the means were separated significantly and sometimes they were not. That's what I was looking for. So I tried to create sort of a limit situation where there was a chance the students might find a significant result and a chance they might not. I really, one reason I like to do this is to get away from that feeling that the students have that, that the whole problem has been set out before they start and that if they guess certain parts of the problem, they know exactly how everything else is going to go. And I probably have patterns of preferring a significant result or a non-significant result. And I think it's more interesting for the students and me not to have any idea whether the result is going to be significant or not. But to have it, but to try and put the situation where it could work out that way or not work out that way. So now that I have those two data groups, basically I have of value. So the blue, there we go. These are the numbers I got on the red values. That's the numbers I got. The mean of the red, the red is higher than the mean of the blue. Um, and we can do a t-test on those. I'll let the students do that t-testing. I'm just interested in generating the data here right now. But those just exist as little vectors, just disconnected floating objects in the R workspace. So what I want to do is give the students two data sets, format data set. If I could trust them enough, I would just give them the two vectors and tell them to do what they want with them. But that's really expecting a lot of students to be able to manage vectors, maybe put them into a data frame. I mean, I was pushing their limits technically anyway. So I gave them two data frames. The first data frame is the data in long format, and the second data frame is the data in wide format. If it's in long format, that's what they should probably use to analyze this as an independent samples t-test. But if they made a mistake and thought that this was a paired samples t-test situation, I provided everything they needed to really double down on that mistake and analyze everything wrong in, uh, in wide format. But long format, I created this data frame here, BL, um, blue problem long format, or sorry, ballroom problem long format. And I use the data frame to wrap everything. Have you used this before to create data frames? It's very useful. It, yeah, Sophie, Sophie and George are nodding. It works like a list, because data frames are basically just specialized list, list type data in R. So with data frame, you can just um, start uh, listing, as it were, a bunch of, a bunch of do that, but put an equals or something quoted equal and set the data frame structure as you build the data frame very simply. So I've got these two bits here, right? I have and nine observations from the red light dancers to concatenate and put them together. So this is just going to put them into one big long row, one big long string of numbers. And I put that big long string of numbers as one column. Um, oh, actually, that shouldn't say color. That's very silly of me. It should say something like minutes. Let's just change that. So that'll create a column called minutes. I'm going to, and so that's one column. And another column I'm going to call condition. And now condition, all I need to do is have nine times the word blue and nine times the word red and put that right beside the minutes, and that will be our grouping variable. And then it'll be set up in vertical long format, just like I would expect them to do if they were using SPSS, for instance, or Excel. So um, with condition, So I repeat quotation marks, and the number of times I repeat it is nine, that, that N that I made. And then here I concatenate that together with repeating red. So this is getting a little dull, but um, yeah. so that'll just create blue, 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 red, 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 etc. Nine times each. So when I run this, I will have a nice data frame. 
So let's look at this data frame and see if it looks like we expect it to. It does. There we go. It's beautiful. This is long format data, and if they do a t-test on this, it's very easy. t-test um, minutes by condition data data equals bl. That should do it, right? There we go. So in this case, non-significant result. That's that's what they should be doing. But I'm I want to provide them the data in wide format just to mess them up if they want to. Could be nice. Uh, you can use the write table function, write dot table, not to the clipboard. So let me switch my screen share a little bit here. I'm gonna do a different sort of screen share. I want to I want to share the entire uh, full screen experience there. Okay, so I should be sharing my whole screen, not just our studio here. So that, the reason I'm going to do that is I'm going to start Excel and show you what happens when you paste there. Um, I'm going to put Excel over here. So if I do write table, usually I use this to put my data onto my hard drive, on my hard disk, and back up my data or something like that. But instead of a file, I use the word clipboard, and I make the tab character, the ASCII tab character, back, backslash T. So R, in general, interprets at a very low level all this text. So if you write a backslash T or a backslash N, R will interpret that as, a, or it'll write a very low level formatted file, text file, that you can import into something else that will interpret that slash N and that slash T as like a new line or a tab. And there are a number of other things you can do with that. So I'm going to do that here, and what that I hope has done has copied the BL data set to the clipboard. So at first, I was having my students just do this and then um, and then just paste. So I just did Control V there. So with the slash T, Excel recognizes. Um, tab separated values more easily than other kinds of things to just automatically be an Excel formatted type file. So if you ever create a table that's rectangular and is separated by tabs, you can paste it directly into Excel. Anyway, I was doing this with my students and that was useful to me for a little while. So, but I actually create this to fool them. And this is very easy because I just need two columns. So I created blue Red minutes, and that's actually very easy. So, and you easy, you see how the data frame function values, comma, name of another column. Just keep doing that if you have values to add. It's a very nice way to create uh, a, a rectangular matrix. So B W, there we go. So now here it is in wide format versus long format. So the students are going to see both of these things and not know um, necessarily from any clues that I've given them which data set is the best to analyze. Again, I could have just given them the vectors or something and told them to put the data in the format they liked it, but I chose to do this. And we could do the right table thing again, but um, I did Now, just so you can see something, how I did this with other problems, I did a different problem for ANOVA where I had multiple groups. I said there were some miners who were bringing up certain number of kilograms of coal up to the surface and there were four teams. I wanted to see if each team brought the same amount of coal. So I'm doing the same thing here. I'm creating a randomly selected N. I'm Here I'm using the RNorm function to select that number of uh, observations from a normal distribution where the mean and the standard deviation are defined by a random function, so within certain limits, that makes the results seem sort of reasonable. I do the same thing for groups two, three, and four, although I put everything on the same. Wide format data. There we go. Team one, team two, team three, team four. Or I can do what I did before and create 
long format data that very similar to what I did in the previous example. And I'm going to go through this without spending too much time because it's pretty similar to what I did last time. But here's the, oops, oops, minor long. There we go. There's the minor long format data. You can see you have the number of kilos they hauled up and then which team it was. Team 1, Team 2, Team 3, Team 4. And of course they should probably uh, use one versus the other for certain analyses, but that's up to them to figure out. Now you can also do this with qualitative stuff. So I was imagining um, a survey that asked people what level or category their income is. So income was an ordered categorical variable and what their relationship status was. Now before I go any further, I just realized I haven't paused for a while. Do you have any questions or comments for me before I go any further? I noticed that you use the same uh, variance for this data. Is there a particular reason for that? Um, I made roughly the same standard deviation for each group? Yes. I mean, uh, have you thought about uh, changing or why, what's the reason? I mean, I know there are different formulas in the textbooks, right, depending whether the variances are the same or not. But uh, if you want to create a more realistic situation, you might deviate a little bit. I, I don't know. I just noticed this. Yes. Um... I, I thought about that. You could. Are you saying you could create widely different variances between groups? Mm -hmm. So they'd have to think about whether the groups have equivalent variance or not, and whether they should do, say, an ANOVA? It's another case, and usually considered in textbooks as separate section, right? Whether Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I chose to make it, well, the variance isn't going to be the same. The variance is sampled between a pretty small range for variance, as you've noticed. So if you look at variance of M1, variance of M2, they're relatively close together. They're not going to be, you know, a factor of five different or a factor of ten different or something, those rules of thumb that people sometimes tell you. And I chose that just because with my students, I felt I was giving them enough to think about as it was. If I had more advanced students or if I had focused more on uh, analyzing, evaluating variance differences between groups, then I might have done what you suggest and maybe have one group have wildly different variants. Or even just go over here and um, I could say like, uh, <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> I could make everybody's variance vary between the standard yeah. deviation between 100 and 4,000 and then you would probably get some very, very different variance between the groups if I wanted to. But I chose not to just because I didn't want to be an issue with my particular students on that test. Any, any other questions? Anything else anybody would like to comment on? Or you, you gave the students the data in two different forms. Yes. Uh, expecting them to be able to make the decision whether they should consider the data as paired or not. That's true. Uh, what was your experience? Did they, did they make the right choice generally, or? As I recall, most of the time, yes. But I adjusted my grading so that if they chose the wrong format, they didn't lose all the points for the question. They, lo they lost some points for choosing the wrong question. But then, if they followed up in an appropriate way that would have been appropriate if their wrong format had actually been correct, then I gave them the points for that. But we, I tried to spend some time talking to them about data organization, and we had done some examples for how to organize our data to analyze it for t-tests and ANOVA and stuff, and long versus wide format. So I thought I had prepared them up fairly well, but a, a number of students missed that point, so I adjusted my grading. This gives a rich opportunity for follow-up after the exam. That's you true. You turn to that particular issue. All right, so in the last example, I want to so, yeah, you could make up better examples than this. Anyway, I, I, want, I wanted to um, have two different categorical variables. One of them I wanted to be ordered, which could be kind of fun. So one of them is an unordered categorical variable, nominal variable, 
and that's relationship status. And the values were single, married, div sep, which is divorced or separated, or other. And then their income category, I chose very low, low, average, high, or very high, which could be pretty reasonable, um, given that uh, if you had real data, you, that you might categorize it this way, because sometimes sociologists and demographers collect data this way, and it's always a horribly non-normal distribution. So you can create, at first I just created these two vectors. So um, income and relationship, relationship, there we go. It's just vectors of, of words, basically, lists of words, so vectors of character values. And income, relationship, income, there we go. And those are pools I was going to use to sample from a little bit later. So the sample size, income N, I once again chose a, a sample size randomly for each student, and it's between 90 and 120, and I chose one value. So income N, okay, we got 92, down near the bottom of the range. Now, creating the values, once again, we want to create two strings of values sampled from this space. So this is the sample space I created. This is the sample space for relationship status, and this is the sample space from which to sample for, um, for income. So And I just chose um, a, a flat distribution. I could have done RUNIF or something like that, but sample is a really handy function. If you give it any range of any kinds of objects or values, it just samples from that range of objects. So if I said, you know, 1 to 100, then it will sample 92 things from the range of 1, oops, <laughs> then it will sample 92 things from the range of 1 to 100. This vector right here, it will sample from this. And I use replace equals true this time, so sample with replacement. And so I'm just going to create a flat distribution, because um, this isn't numeric anyway. So IRR, there we go. There's my relationship statuses. There's 92 of them. And then I got a little fancy here for income values, and I had to learn about distributions that I don't really understand. So I don't really understand the gamma distribution, except to know that in general it gives you really nice, positively skewed distributions that look kind of like income distributions. And so I thought, I'll make the data especially realistic. Not that the students will know or care or notice, but I thought I was being fancy. So um, I chose a number of items from the gamma distribution that will randomly sample from the gamma found out that using one as the shape parameter, you can actually put a number of parameters in there and uh, that you only need, uh, I think you only need the n. So it's going to sample 92 objects from a gamma distribution, but I chose one as the shape parameter. And that, pr that produced, I found after some fooling around and trial and error, that produced a nice distribution because I wanted the income values to be distributed like income really is. So IRI, there's my gamma distribution, and it's very much distributed like a gamma distribution, so very nice. Now I'm going to use that using a little, a couple of little, map my very low, very low, or very low, low, moderate, high, very high type thing, my ordinal. So I'm going to use the cut function, a continuous um, variable, and cut it at the points you specify. So I'm just saying cut it, cut my continuous 92 observations here, and cut them into five pieces. Five pieces along the range of possible values, not, not like listing low to high and getting five evenly even n groups, but it will cut on the range of possible values. So looking back at the graph, the range of values is zero to three, so it will make cuts along this. And so you'll have a lot more people in this group than in this group, which is what I want. So I want this to look like income. So I'm going to cut that. And then the cut function creates this really bizarre output that I don't really know what to do with. But it looks like this. It has the notation for open-ended and closed-ended intervals instead of um, actual numbers. So R can represent that internally, which is kind of fun. I don't know how to analyze it, but I don't need to analyze it because next what I'm going to do this is um, 
So IRI, it's just a character vector. It's not a factor. Now, R has a special definition for factors. And when you have a factor, you have the number value of the factor, which you never see, really. But then you have the label of the factor, which is called the level in R. So there's always a number, li a number value for each factor underlying things. And then there's a level that you see. And that really makes working with factors confusing until you realize that. But for this, it's very nice. If I use the function levels, that's a function that only works with factors. So I think what's happening here is um, if I look at this vector of 92 gamma ranges that have been clumped according to um, five different possible ranges they could be in, and then I apply my five ranges here, my five labels here, it will label my gamma ranges with those five labels. And in the process, it will turn I, it will turn ir.i, this vector of values, into a factor because levels don't make any sense for anything except a factor in R. So now I look at iri, and I have exactly what I want. Um, so I could do I could do a bar graph, and this is what I want. This is a nice income distribution. That's an ordinal categorical factor. Now, that was just way too much effort to do that. I could have just done some random values from a uniform distribution, and the students never would have known. But uh, it was fun. And you can also change this into an ordered factor, although what I'm doing here works whether you do that or not. R has a special designation for ordered factor. And this kind of makes absolutely sure that those levels stay in an order. And now I create a data frame. In this case, I didn't make a choice between long and wide format. I just said, the test is getting long. You've already had a chance to think about long versus wide format. So I'm just going to give you the data in, the, in a good format here. So I create a data frame. And relationship equals, and I give the relationship values. And income equals the income values. And as long as there's the same number of relationship values as there are income values, and there should be 92 in this case for both, then I, I should have that created. There we go. So now we have two variables, just as they would appear in a data matrix, where rows would be participants and columns would be um, the two variables, relationship and income. So I've created these, these two variables, um, or the, these data sets here for, for the students. Any questions so far? I kind of like working with categorical data. It's fun. I didn't know how to do it at first, working with text strings. But the more I learn how to do it, the more entertaining it is. Now I did this business. Um, I, I could have just left it at this and just given them a USB drive and said, you know, run this script or said download this script and run it and then do this with the output. But I wanted to make it as painless as possible for them. And so I spent way too much time on this. So I did an interactive thing here. I used readline. Now readline, if you assign the output to an object, then it becomes an interactive thing. And so this script, when the students run it, it, it'll just automatically generate all this data, these objects. And then this is the first thing the students are going to see, because everything else happened silently and invisibly. There was, there was no output yet. So the only thing the students are going to see is this business. Um, so it's asking me for my first name and my last name, because I use these commands. Now I have these objects. So first name is my first name, and last name is my last name there. And then this was a trick I had to Google a lot to figure out. And I could only use it easily because I'm not a computer scientist at all. But I was in a room where every single computer was running the same operating system. And every student had their user profile in the same place on the computer. So G sub is just to substitute stuff. I did this funky little thing to um, create a string that creates this path. So this hunted around. I'm using Windows 7 right now. So this hunted around right on my desktop and found out the path to my home folder. C, users, Rogers, D, desktop. So I found the desktop in my home folder. Now R actually has functions to create directories, to delete directories, create files, move things around. So I'm going to use this dir create dir to create a file. And I'm going to 
the file I said before, and I'm going to add an exam to the end of it. And then um, I created a directory. And then I'm going to create another object that's the full path, and I'm going to set the R workspace current working directory, set WD, to that full, pit, full path. So now when I save anything without giving it a path, it'll just save it to that place. So if you don't want to follow this, feel free, but this isn't the important part. The important part's already done. Um, and then I use the paste command, which I use a lot, to paste the last name and the first name between them. Rogers hyphen Darren. And now I'm going to write data to this working directory. So I'm going to write my ballroom long problem, my ballroom wide, my mining long, my mining wide, and then my income and relationship problem. And with this command, you can write a CSV file that will be opened easily by Excel. And I do that as a backup. This, I don't really need this because the students are going to email me or upload to Blackboard their R data workspace, which has all this stuff in it. But I, this was my backup. I had them email me the whole directory. Just zip the whole directory and upload it or email it or something like that. I think they might have uploaded it to a um, to a, a file to a, an assignment in Blackboard. Now, in the middle of this, I've used paste. I've pasted the name of the file, but I've also pasted. It's going to be a bunch of CSV files, each of which is a data set, and then each of them is going to have my name in it. And there's a, as an instructor, this will help me if I get confused at all of what I'm grading. I can just look at the names of files, and I can know which students' work I'm grading. I thought that was actually going to be pretty important. And then this is the most important part, perhaps. You can save the image. So I'm going to paste. Here, let's just look at this part. Paste and our data um, and separate with nothing. So this is what the name of that image is going to be. So I'm going to create a workspace file and that has all this stuff in it. Everything we've done here is in this image. And I'm just going to save that in that folder. I don't have to specify the folder anymore because I set the working directory back here. So it's going to save to the desktop with that student's file. Now I'm getting entirely too ridiculous.
full screen here. Oh, here we go. It created this folder called exam on my desktop and ignoring all this other stuff that you don't need to know. I'm copying files here in the background. It created, can you guys see this here? Because I can't see you anymore. I put it out of the way. Exam ballroom, long, Rogers, Darren, et cetera, et cetera. And most importantly, this R data file that has my name in it. So, all right. So that should have been enough. <laughs> but then I was having a hard time making Blackboard accept the kinds of answers I wanted it to accept. It, it's hard to make Blackboard do things for math problems and stats problems where you want multiple answers for one question, etc. So I did this business. I uploaded a, a Word document that had spaces for all the answers to my website, to this URL here. And then I told R, as it ran this script, to download that Word document into that folder. And then to pay, and then to um, print this for the students. So this is how the students knew they were done. They would ask them for their first name and their last name, and then they would see this. And that's all the students see. Meanwhile, um, they have all this stuff downloaded for them. And one of the things that was downloaded was this, uh, let's see if I can find it here, this document. So, yeah, here's the Word document I had automatic. It's very ugly, it, but I think it's useful. It has some... So I had them just run the command and then do the Word document, and it has the problems in it. And then I have yellow where they're supposed to type stuff in here. And since they're in a lab, they all have Microsoft Word, so I know that they can all use it. And I have them um, bold the correct answers to certain questions about how things worked out. I tell them there's the instructions, bold your answer. To, it worked for them. They all understood this part pretty well. They knew how to do this. And then there's places where I had highlighted etc. And then they could paste the results from R, which created big, obnoxious, long files. But that was okay. I know how to read them. So this is the file I had them download. And I did this so that there would be a very, very structured way that they were reporting the results of this exam. Extremely overly complex thing I did for my students for an exam this last fall. And I became very impressed at all the things R can do. It can handle files. It can create directories. It can hunt down what the user's directory is on a number of operating systems, but I didn't look up how to do that with Windows, or sorry, with um, anything other than Windows 7. It can be interactive and accept data from the students. This was all so I could get personalized exams. And I think that's all I have for you. Any questions? It seems that this puts the students in a position that they're doing higher level thinking. Yes, I think so. And I do like to make the students jump out of the material and into the material and out of the material. And I enjoy that fact that when they have to work with computers, it's just unfamiliar enough for most of them that they do have to jump in and out and in and out because it makes things harder. But I think that's a critical statistical, critical thinking skill so of the future. What, uh, what uh, were your student evaluations after that? When I did this last, last spring, they hated it so much. The students want to come in and sit down and just start working, and I understand that. Um, but I had my goals. A minor goal was this interaction with multiple levels of their environment. The major goal was just trying to make sure that everything was individualized and that there was essentially no incentive to cheat. Uh, Darren, so after yes. this class, um, uh, how many students uh, get A? How many students get B and C? I mean, you don't have to let us know the, 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 the their grades you reported, but just based on your truly evaluation, your feeling, how many percent A? Basically, meaning they the students really learn, get to get to enjoy the part you're trying to teach them. It was a difficult class because they were having to learn R, and I found very quickly. This was the second semester I had taught R. The first one was really rough and I ended up backing off a lot of what I had done, what a, a lot of my ambitions because the students were having too difficult a time and it was getting in the way of learning the material. But it was still tougher than some other stats classes they had taken, partly because of R and partly for very good reasons because I would have them do something and say, okay, open up R and generate some random data for me for this next example. or. Um, open up R and do, do this by hand and use R to check your work. And so I was doing a lot of this 
that was actually useful, but it was difficult for them. It took extra class time. Those students that, that have an elementary stack course with R as a component leave the course with some tools that they could actually use statistics with, whereas students who do not have the course with R and just essentially the regular textbook kind of thing, I'm not sure that they really have the tools that they can actually do anything with. I, I agree. I, I think being able to interact with computers in a way that is more detailed and fundamental than Facebook is a skill that will uh, set students above their peers in the social sciences. I think in the physical sciences and the life sciences it's much more common for students, and I, I think maybe math, it's much more common for students to even have to code for their assignments. The people who know more technical stuff, they have a leg up on everybody else. And the people who can critically think, of course. But you can, as my wife has demonstrated, you can learn amazing critical thinking by studying Latin. You don't need to study math and computers to learn critical thinking, although that is one way to learn it. But I really love the fact that students are going to need to consume data. And a, a significant minority of them are going to be asked to create data, even if they're therapists, even if they're working in bureaucracies as civil services. And the students who can, who can feel comfortable in that environment have an advantage in getting jobs and keeping jobs um, and working with clients, no matter who those clients are, than the, than the students who can't. If all you can do is point and click on Facebook, that's one level of interaction with a computer. But if you have a deeper level of interaction available to you, even if you don't remember any of the details of R, if you remember that you had the experience of writing code and making it do stuff, I think that's a powerful experience that would convince you that you, you should try it again someday and it will be okay. Really enjoyed your presentation, Darwin. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. It was really nice.